Honduras is a beautiful country. We have about 8 million people here. The majority of the people in Honduras are very young in age. There's great things taking place in Honduras. There's a tremendous revival taking place. Operación Niño Navidad is an opportunity that God is giving to the children of Honduras to be able to know Jesus Christ and to know that God loves them. With Operation Christmas Child, we work with national leadership teams who in turn go and equip local churches, and the local church then can do outreach, evangelism, discipleship, and impact their communities for Christ. When uh, the shoebox is open, I am pretty sure many things are changing in their lives. When they uh, open the, the box, it is an explosion inside of them, an uh, explosion of happiness, and uh, enjoying this, uh, this moment is, is amazing. I really love the distribution. The kids are playing, are laughing, are joyful. You can feel the presence of God. Distribution. The kids are so excited. Come and check it out. After the children receive these shoe boxes, they participate in the Samaritan's Purse Discipleship Program, The Greatest Journey. We're seeing an entire generation being raised up of evangelists, of multipliers, of agents of mission, children sharing Jesus with their friends, with their family, and entire communities being transformed for Christ. Operation Christmas Child is doing an amazing work in my country. It's, it's something so special because we can see right now many lives changes, families, and uh, all the population in my country is feeling, receiving, and enjoying the new hope through Operation Christmas Child. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. That is a reminder that um, you can still pick up a box if you would like to um, fill an Operation Christmas ch Shoe Child box for um, to send overseas to a child in need. You can still pick up those boxes if you have them already. Collection Sunday is coming up. Um, but welcome to Liberty Baptist Church. It's good to see all of you this morning. I hope that you're doing well. If you are with us for the very first time, you're a first time visitor today, we are glad that you are worshiping with us. We look forward to getting to know you. Please don't leave this morning before you fill out a visitor's card. You can fill out a physical card or scan the QR code in the proclaimer. But again, we're so happy that you are here. Um, it's a busy time of year. I say that every week. I don't think that there's ever a time when we're not busy, but there are a few things that I want to highlight that are in the Proclaimer. 
There is a new members class this coming Saturday, the 12th at 9 a.m. Um, if you are interested in becoming a new member, if you know you would like to become one, this is the class for you. If you're not sure and you'd like some more information or you're curious about that, this is also the class for you. So you can still sign up, contact the church office, and learn all that you would like to learn about this church. We, um, we would love to have you join, but most importantly, we want you to be sure that you are where the Lord has you. So this class is for you if you are interested. The youth are having a fireside faith youth event at the home of Tommy and Valerie this coming Friday evening, starting at 6.30. It's going to be a time of fellowship around the campfire, food, worship, um, encouragement. So if you are youth aged and you would like to join, you would like to attend, you can sign up online, talk to Tommy if you need more information. The Ladies of Liberty are taking a trip to the Peaks of Otter this Saturday, leaving at 8.30 in the morning, coming back later on in the day. Um, meet here at the church and then head out from there. That will be a great day of hiking and fellowship. Ladies, if you would like to join, you can sign up online. This coming Friday is Veterans Day, and um, we want to pause and take a moment to honor anyone who's a veteran here um, in our church family. If you are a veteran, will you please stand? We want to honor you and thank you um, just collectively for what you've done. We hope that you feel our deep love and appreciation. And in light of Veterans Day that's coming up on Friday, will you please now turn your attention to the screen for a video? For the freedom you fought for and the flag you stood for. For the country we cherish and the people we love. For the bravery you showed and the fortitude you held. For the days of dedication and the nights of devotion. For the miles you walked and the skills you learned. For the months of training and the years of service. For the memories you carry of the battles you saw. For the legacy of your courage and the honor you deserve. When our nation needed you most, you answered the call. A deep and unshakable sense of allegiance and responsibility. You were bold, you did not hesitate, and you did not walk away. You were gone for holidays and anniversaries and birthdays, because while we were living in peace and freedom, you were fighting for it. Thank you is not enough. We can't repay you but we will promise to remember. You are the reason we can sing the land of the free and the home of the brave. You are the heroes among us. You are not forgotten. You are the veterans. We remember your courage, we honor your sacrifice, and we thank you today. We do remember, honor, and thank our veterans. As we begin our worship time this morning together, let's stand. We have a powerful God who has saved us who has promised to walk with us through every situation and circumstance. He is a mighty God. Sing together. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, 
I feel the presence of heaven And just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can't do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can do. And just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. And just one word, and you revive every dream. And just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. Oh, there's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can do. Oh, I know there's nothing that our God can do. A prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Oh. God, we put our faith and our trust in you. You will see us through. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that Jesus can do. Oh, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Yeah. Oh, oh. that our God has the power to break sin, the power of sin and death in our lives. So praise. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Oh, thank you, Jesus. What love could remember? No wrongs we have done. 
omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum, thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the long-suffering what patient would wait as we constantly what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. God, we are thankful that in our lost state, our sin, that you saw fit to give us your son, Jesus Christ, to extend to us your grace and your never-ending mercy. What riches, what riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord.
to prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would do in our heart that which only you can do. God, we're thankful that you can take our restless hearts. You can take our restless soul. And God, you can give us peace. God, we hear the truthfulness of Jesus when he says, come unto me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest even rest for your souls. And so, God, to the restless souls among us, God, would you minister your peace? God, would we feel your presence? Would we know that you are with us? And God, we would not just hear about your life, but God, in our life, we would experience the life that you offer. God, on this Sunday before Veterans Day, God, we pray. God, we pray for all those who are in authority that we may live a peaceable and quiet life in all godliness. God, we long for the day. God, as the prophet Isaiah sees, a day where we will make war no more. God, where the weapons of war will be turned into instruments of peace. And God, we look to you, the Prince of Peace. God, we ask for your peace, not only in our hearts, but God, we ask for peace in your world. And God, we know that won't fully be accomplished until you come. And so we pray, Lord, hasten the day when our faith will be made sight. 
God, when the sky will be rolled back as a scroll, the Lord will descend and the trump will resound and we'll be able to say, God, it's well in our souls. God, we pray for the many in our church who are struggling in many different ways. God, from those who are struggling with physical ailments, with those who are struggling with emotional concerns with those who are lost in our community that need the message of the gospel. God, help us to be your hands and your feet. Help us to minister to those around you. And God, give us what we need to be able to see those who are in need. And God, help us to be obedient, to follow after you. Be with us in this moment. God, may we feel your presence in a special way. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God. 
This upcoming Friday is Veterans Day, and so veterans, this Sunday we honor you. We pray that you feel the honor of this church family today. Also, it was stated in the announcements, but I think this is a great church to be a part of. And so this upcoming Saturday is our new member class. It gives you an opportunity to, to hear about what we're about and also give you a pathway to join the church. So if you're interested in joining the church, it is not too late to sign up this Saturday, nine to noon with lunch. Won't you join us and be a part of what we're doing here at Liberty Baptist Church. Well, we continue in this message series with only two more messages after today, uh, of which the title of the message series is Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. We have, in our world, evaluated so many things, but one area that I think we have overlooked that is the root of humanity's problem, it is our own sinfulness. You can do a lot for a person, but until a person's heart is changed from the inside out by the person of Jesus, transformation cannot occur. Today I have decided to do something a little unusual because I am picking up today three questions what I have entitled difficult questions about sin that in some ways wrap up kind of a section of this series before I complete the series in the next two weeks. These questions come to me from time to time, and so I thought today I would answer the questions and then give you some personal application for your life. Three difficult questions, here they are, about sin. Number one, are all sins equal? That's the first question. Number two, What is, and this is a question you may not know is a question, but now that I tell you, you'll think about it. What is, I'm quoting the Bible here, which is 1 John 5, 16 and 17, references 
the sin unto death. So what is the sin unto death? Question number two. And then question number three, what is the unpardonable sin? Three big questions. Are all sins equal? What is the sin unto death? And what is the unpardonable sin? Some of the message today is me just giving you the answer to the question. But another part is to tell you how understanding these three questions makes you think differently about sin in your own life and in the lives of others. And I would propose in the last five or so minutes of the message, we'll give you significant insight into your own spiritual life. I'm not yet answering the question, but why do I pick up these questions? Well, in some ways, question number one helps me answer question number two and three. There are some times as a pastor, as a student of the Bible, what I hear people say, uh, I think to myself, well, that may be what you believe, that may be what the church believes, that may even be what the community believes, but it might not be what the Bible says. And on the question, are all sins equal? I think the typical Christian says, well, sure they are. All sins are equal. Well, we got somebody saying no in the front row. Okay, you're in the minority, I believe. Um, and actually, for most people, if you say, uh, if there is a terrible sin that is more terrible than any of the other sins, the most terrible sin is you telling anybody that their sin is more terrible than yours. That's the most terrible one. Um, and I would propose, although this is not my text today, that we have probably misunderstood the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. So let me be clear off the front end. Jesus condemns judgmentalism. The famous words of Jesus, do not judge lest you be judged. But we ought to continue reading what Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Jesus says, if you evaluate another person's sin before appropriately evaluating your own sin, you are committing the sin of judgmentalism. That's what Jesus is saying. But Jesus will affirm that once a person has appropriately self-judged, they are in a position to appropriately judge. That's precisely what Jesus said. So sometimes we get half of the truth and not the whole truth. So are all sins equal? We've got a lot to say about that. The second big idea, most people have likely not even heard about the sin unto death, so I'm going to have to introduce the problem and give you an answer to it today, likely. And there's one particular misunderstanding today that I want to push away in regard to the unpardonable sin. Literally, I get the same question every six months, so if you listen up today, Maybe that question won't come to me anymore. Okay, about the unpardonable sin, please. You know, I'll answer it once and be done. You say, okay, Rusty, it sounds like you're coming at me today with a lot. Well, I might be. But you also have a bulletin. We call it the proclaimer. On the back of it are all the scriptures I'm going to use, a full outline of everything I'm going to say. So if you hear it and feel like you need to review it, you can. It's right there in your bulletin, in your proclaimer. Three texts today, if you want to try to follow along in your Bible, John 19, 11, 1 John 5, 16 and 17, Matthew 12, 31 and 32. These are not the only texts I'm going to use, but these are the main ones, so you ought to mark your Bible in those places, but everything else I'm going to say will be on the screen. Question number one, point number one, to understand sin we should evaluate if all sins are equal. So let me then first of all state in which way all sins are in fact equal. There is a sense in which all sins are equal. And let me tell you what that way is. All sins are equal in the sense that 
All sins are violations of God's commands. James 2.10, this is the key text most people point to when they're talking about the equality of sin. James 2.10 says, for whoever keeps the entire law yet fails in one point is guilty of breaking it all. So let me not be misunderstood. Let me say a few things quite clearly. Number one, we are all sinners, full stop. We are all sinners. And James 2.10, the point of that verse is, even if we only committed in our life one sin, that would then classify us in the category of what? Sinner. And thus we would be condemned we would bear the penalty of our sin even if we only committed one sin. So all sins are equal in the sense that all sins are violations of God's commands and even one sin brings about our condemnation as sinners. Now, have I said that in a very full-throated way? I think I have so that you hear me. But interestingly enough, the person that most people quote to say, all sins are equal, full stop, is the person of Jesus. That's the one they point to. And it is precisely Jesus who combats the idea that all sins are equal. Now, let me give you the words of Jesus for a moment. The, the, uh, I, it is this simple truth that it is Jesus, and I'm going to give you the text, affirms gradations of sin. You need to know that. And gradation means degree of sin. You say, are you sure, Rusty? Yes. John 19, 10, and 11. I read it to you, and then I'm going to pause, and you're going to finish Jesus's words, okay? Get ready. I'm going to give you the cue. Jesus is on trial before Pontius Pilate. Verse 10 says, so Pilate said to him, to Jesus, you're not talking to me. Don't you know that I have authority to release you and the authority to crucify you. Jesus responds, you would have no authority over me at all, Jesus answered him. If it hadn't been given you from above, this is why the one who handed me over to you has, you read the text, the greater sin. So it is Jesus who affirms degrees of sin. There's no other way to read the text and in every translation, ESV, KJV, in New King, King James, CSB, they all have the same translation, the greater sin. We don't have a translation problem here. Now notice who hands Jesus over to Pontius Pilate. The simple answer is we're not exactly sure who Jesus is referencing. Two very good candidates, Caiaphas, which is one of the religious leaders, the most likely person, Judas. And Jesus is basically putting the finger in Judas's chest and says, Judas, you have committed a greater sin. Your sin is greater than the other sins. Just want you to stick with this for a moment One of the reasons Judas is responsible for committing a greater sin, and we'll see this theme develop, is Judas has a front row seat to Jesus, a front row seat. And he gets to go nose to nose with Jesus. And at the end of Judas's life, he says, Jesus, I reject you. Jesus says, that's a greater sin. This theme will continue, but just stick with it. It is also Jesus who affirms, you ready for this, that on judgment day, those who have rejected Jesus will not get equal punishment. It's Jesus who says this. Uh, And now I read, uh, there are gradations or degrees of judgment for sin on judgment day. For a person who says, I do not need the grace of God, I'll face God on my own, then Jesus says, well, some people will get greater degrees of judgment than others. You say, are you sure? Let's listen to Jesus. Matthew 10, verse 15. He says, I assure you, Jesus speaking, 
it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is not a great place to be from, than for that town. So it's going to be more tolerable, which means Sodom and Gomorrah is, uh, is going to get less judgment, that's what Jesus is saying, than these towns. Now, what are these towns that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 10? Uh, you know, this already is going to be a longer sermon, potentially, so we don't want to make it any longer. Let me give you some quick context, okay? Here's the quick context. Jesus is sending his apostles, his disciples saying, I'm giving you my message. I'm giving you the ability to perform miracles. And I want you to go into these towns and share with them the message about me. And Jesus is aware that there will be some of these towns that will hear the message from the apostles' mouth. We'll see the signs that the apostles do and they will reject Jesus. And Jesus says, those towns will get a stricter judgment than other towns like Sodom and Gomorrah, which was no, well, moral place. But what did Sodom and Gomorrah not have? The full revelation of Jesus. That's what they didn't have. They will still be condemned, but not to the degree of these towns who get full revelation of Jesus and then rejected. This idea of those who know and reject is different than those who have lesser knowledge and reject. Jesus now quoting a parable. I read it for you, Luke 12, 47 and 48. Jesus talking about future judgment says, and that slave who knew his master's will and didn't prepare himself or do it will be severely beaten the one who knows it, but then it says, but the one who did not know and did things deserving of blows will be beaten lightly, showing degrees of judgment again. Notice, much will be required of everyone who has been given much, and even more will be expected of the one who has been entrusted with, with, uh, with more. One final text. I give it to you. So most people quote James 2.10, if you break one, you're guilty of all, that text. And they say, see, James says all sin is equal. But literally, if you're reading James 2.10 and you just keep on reading, because after James chapter 2, this is not a trick question, comes James chapter 3. And literally in James chapter 3 verse 1, it says this, talking about wah, the pastors, I don't like this text. Uh, not many should become teachers. You're talking about pastors, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. So if I'm in this role and I'm not a Christian and I'm deceiving people, whoa, in trouble. You're not kidding. You say, well, what do we do with all of this? How do we speak about this? So I'm going to try to simplify it for you. You ready for this? You, you may judge me now, okay? So judge not lest you be judged. <laughs> Don't judge me. So I tried to, I, years ago, I tried to simplify this. How do I simplify this concept? And literally what popped into my head, now don't, don't, don't judge me now, okay, <laughs> in the right sense of the word, what popped into my head was, I think I can simplify it. I came up with, you ready? Now you're going to, I know you people, you're going to judge me. What popped into my head is the condemnation calculator, okay? So let me show you how this works. You ready for it? You, can you do a little division? So this does seem to be how Jesus evaluates our responsibility, and I think it works with all the text. So first of all, let's, let's, our first thing we have to input in our condemnation calculator is the degree to which you understand who Jesus is. Revelation, your awareness of things. You understand this? And then you divide that, the amount of revelation you have, divided by your response equals your responsibility. Do you track with this? Let's put Judas in it. 
Judas has high degrees of revelation, right? Little response, no response, big condemnation. That's what Jesus says, and the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. But then let's put two towns, like the towns who rejected Jesus and the town of Sodom and Gomorrah. Even though they both don't respond, one of them has the towns that got the message of Jesus have higher revelation than Sodom and Gomorrah. And Jesus says it'll be more tolerable on the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than the towns who got full revelation. Now, this creates a bit of a problem for you church-going people. <laughs> Because if you just sit here week after week and go, mm-hmm, 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 <laughs> guess what's happening? Your revelation's going up. Your culpability is going up. To whom much is given, much is required going up. And if you give a big zero, you're going to roll up on judgment day and say, yeah, Jesus, I didn't need you. And he goes, so were you unaware of what you were doing? And you go, for kind I was aware. You see how this works. So actually, to the degree to which you understand God and his ways is the degree to which you're responsible for them. You say, well, I want to be real clear. No matter how much you have sinned, if you fall on the mercy and grace of God, you will be saved. Did you hear that? No matter how much you have sinned, if you fall on the mercy and grace of God, you will be saved. But listen, if you reject the mercy and grace of God and say, I'll just face God on my own on judgment day, while Jesus will forgive all sin, those who face Jesus on judgment day will be guilty to greater degrees. And that is not some interesting thing I thought up this week in my office. This has been the clear teaching of the church for 2,000 years. And somehow in the shuffle, we've missed it. I want to clean it up. I got two other questions. I can move quickly. Are all sins equal? Here's the summary. All sins are equal in the sense that they are violations of God's commands, full stop. Secondly, I should not evaluate another person's sin until I have appropriately evaluated my own sin. However, a person who has greater knowledge of Jesus greater knowledge of God's ways and then rejects that knowledge is more responsible and has committed a greater sin than someone who has not. That is, I believe, the correct answer to the question. This is what we call nuanced. <laughs> Means you don't just say one simple thing. Now let's go, oh, I got one more issue here I need to address on this one, I'm sorry. Uh, um, one other issue. Um, you're going to have to be gracious, gracious to me and give me 10 extra minutes today. Sins done willfully, rebelliously, are not evaluated the same as done, those done in ignorance or weakness. I've kind of already said this, but uh, the Bible differentiates sins done in rebellion and sins done in ignorance or weakness. Now, I apologize. The book of Hebrews is not the easiest book in the Bible to read. I'm perfectly aware of that. But what the writer of Hebrews is doing is reiterating an Old Testament concept, okay? So this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. I'm going to read the text. The writer of Hebrews is saying, if an Old Testament person who just has the revelation of the Ten Commandments rejects that, well, that's bad. But a person who knows about Jesus and rejects that, it is worse. And if a person uh, rebelliously, flagrantly rejects Jesus, that is 
really bad. That's the purpose. So I read the text, and then I'm going to quote two Old Testament texts and move on to my next question. Hebrews 10, 26, it says, for if we deliberately sin, this, this, this idea of intentionality, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, rena- rem- there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment. Notice the strong language here. And the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. And then notice verse 28. If anyone disregards Moses' law, he dis- dies without mercy based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now notice how much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the Son of God? I'm going to stop right there at the text. I want to quote an Old Testament text that shows the differentiation between intentional sins and non-intentional sins. Numbers 15 says in verse 27, if a person sins unintentionally, he is to present a year old female goat as a sin offering. The priest must then make atonement before the Lord on behalf of the person who acts in error, sinning unintentionally. But when he makes atonement for him, he will be forgiven. You are to have the same law for the person who acts in error, whether he is an Israelite or a foreigner who lives among you. That's all about unintentional sin. But now notice verse 30. But if the person acts defiantly, whether native or foreign residents, blasphemes the Lord, that person is to be cut off from his people. Notice there is a difference of evaluation. I would propose that same is brought into the New Testament, just not with all the Old Testament trappings. In Ezekiel 8, verse 6, and I finish this question, he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abomination in the house of Israel is committing here so that I must depart from my sanctuary. Notice again the language of degree. You will see even greater abominations, greater sins. That's the idea. So I feel as though I have not only is it, listen carefully, revelation divided by response. God also evaluates, listen carefully, if our sin is done with what the Old Testament calls a high hand. Means we know what we're doing and we're just like, well, I'm just doing it. This is evaluated differently than sins done in ignorance or weakness. And I am saddened in some level that we just say all sins are equal full stop because one who sins with a high hand is, is, is really presuming upon the grace of God. And one who sins in e- ignorance and weakness, God evaluates differently. Okay, I just want to put the truth out there to you. Two other, two other questions. I'm not going to rush, but I can give you succinct answers. The second big idea today to understand sin, we should investigate the sin unto death. Most of you might not even heard about this. So let me read the text in which it is found. 1 John 5, 16 and 17. Here it is. It says, and I quote, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin that does not bring death, he should ask and God will give life to him to those who commit sin that doesn't bring death. Now notice the next phrase. There is sin that brings death. I am not saying he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin that does not bring death. So you got the sin unto death and the sin to death. Now, I'm just going to be humble here and tell you, I think I know the answer to this question. I could be wrong. There are, two, there are two reasonable answers to the question, so I give you both of them, and I'm going to tell you which one I think is right. And there are only really two reasonable answers, and I'm going to show you which one I'm right. So what I do not think the answer is, although it is found in the Bible, is there have been times in the New Testament where a person sins, and that sin brings about their physical death. You say, really? Yeah. Acts chapter 5 There are two people in the early church named Ananias and Sapphira. They lie about what they're going to give, and God strikes them dead. So that sin brings about their physical death. I don't think it's what the text's talking about, but it is in the New Testament. There's one other occasion where the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 11 
talks about the early church and celebrating the Lord's Supper. And there are people there who celebrate the Lord's Supper who are committing sin and still taking the Lord's Supper. And the Apostle Paul says, and for this reason, meaning sinning at the Lord's Supper, he says, some of you are sick and some of you sleep. Means you died. So there's two. I don't think it's what the text is talking about, but it might be. Because that is a sin that brings a person's death. All right? Um, what I do think this is talking about, what is the right, the whole message of 1 John is trying to assure Christians who believe that they have eternal life. It is a book that gives assurance to Christians. Now listen carefully. A Christian, per the message of 1 John, gains assurance of their salvation, listen carefully, by exhibiting the characteristics of a Christian. That is the message of 1 John. If you love the brothers, if you're walking in the light, if you don't love the world, when these characteristics of the Christian life bubble up inside of you, John says, this should give you assurance. Now, does that mean 1 John says Christians don't sin? No, it does not. Because 1 John also says, if we say that we don't sin, we lie, John says, and we're not telling the truth. However, the goal is not to sin, even though we do sin. Hopefully that's your goal in life, you know. Even though you do sin, you don't want to. You want to overcome it. So John would say to the person who commits sin, but their desire is not to sin. You ready for this? They are sinning, but it is not to their eternal death. And John says, we as Christians have the responsibility to pray for one another, especially when we sin, that God would grant us the ability to overcome it, to give us life, because as Christians we sin, but to glory be unto God, because we're forgiven and we're moving, it is not a sin unto our eternal death. C.S. Lewis said, the balance of our lives shows that we're either walking towards heaven or walking towards hell. I think that's exactly what 1 John is saying. John says, however, there are people that are not sinning, not unto death. There are some people who are like, forget God, I'm going to do my own thing. Just... And guess what John says they are doing? They are committing the sin unto death. They keep walking that way, they'll end in eternal death. And John says our obligation to Christians is to pray for Christians who are sinning to overcome it because we're not sinning unto death. And John says this is our key obligation. It doesn't mean that we don't pray for non-Christians. We do. But our greater obligation is to pray for Christians. That's what the text says. Okay. We're going to move off of that one. It's in the notes. You can read the text. The third idea is to understand sin, we should define the unpardonable sin. Let me read to you the text that talks about the unpardonable sin. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. It says, because of this, I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. That's why it's called the unpardonable sin, because of that phrase. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. And this is an important phrase. Either in this age or in the one to come. Now let me first, now I told you I was going to answer a question so people don't ask me this question, so I'm going to do it right now. Let me tell you what the unpardonable sin is not. Listen carefully. The unpardonable sin is not suicide. I get that question at least every six months. The unpardonable sin is not suicide. Suicide is horrible. And we should do everything we can do to help a person who's contemplating it. And if you are thinking about suicide, we are here to help you. But it is not the unpardonable sin. 
Now you say, where did, this really is in the water, because I get this question a lot. Why do people think suicide is the unpardonable sin? All right, I'm going to tell you the answer to that. They think suicide is the unpardonable sin because of Roman Catholicism. Now, I'm not, I'm not being negative. I'm a Protestant. So Protestants and Roman Catholics, we don't agree on some things. So Roman Catholics believe this. Let me try to be gracious. Roman Catholics um, divide sin into two categories. And on the base level, as a Protestant, I agree with them. They divide sin into unintentional sins and intentional sins. Well, I just pointed out that that's clearly in the Bible. So Roman Catholic doctrine says there are unintentional sins and there are intentional sins. Okay, on that level, I agree. Now, to Roman Catholics, they classify unintentional and intentional with these terms. You ready? An unintentional sin to a Roman Catholic is called a venial sin. Okay? And a intentional sin of a certain quality is called a mortal sin. And if, and now, and suicide is a mortal sin. So if you commit a mortal sin and you don't repent of it, obviously you commit suicide, you can't repent of it, right? You commit a mortal sin and you don't repent of it, Roman Catholic doctrine says you go to hell. Okay, I'm not making a straw man. Now the only thing I don't like to, I don't like for people to make me into a straw man, so I don't want to make the Roman Catholic priest into a straw man. I want to shoot straight. Some Roman Catholic priests would say this, suicide typically will send a person to hell, but it might not if for some degree it is, could be classified as unintentional. Do you see this little workaround, okay? It's a little wiggle room in there, but not much. But that got put in the water, you commit suicide, you're going to hell. Now, let me just say, I am a Protestant, and, and, and Protestant, you know what more important than being a Protestant? A Protestant believes if I can't find it in the Scripture, it's not true. And let me just say full stop, nowhere in the Bible does it say suicide's the unpardonable sin. This is what it says the unpardonable sin is, and I just read it for you. Did you hear the word suicide in there anywhere? No, it didn't exist. Okay. Now, what most people are going to say is this. The unpardonable sin is rejecting Jesus. Okay? And on a very simple level, I agree with you. Okay? So let me be clear. If you reject Jesus until your death, you stand condemned. Okay? Okay? But I think the unpardonable sin, why I wouldn't disagree with that, that's true. I think the unpardonable sin is saying something a little stronger than that. Okay? So, let me give you three things that are clear here in this text. Number one, it is the religious leaders that Jesus is saying, you guys are right on the borderline of committing the unpardonable sin. So again, notice again, the people who usually stand in greatest condemnation are the ones who know the most. Judas, the towns that Jesus went to, pastors, and now the religious leaders. You see, they're, they're the ones who are getting, getting strict judgment. So here are three things that the unpardonable sin has. Number one, a clear knowledge of who Jesus is and of the power of the Holy Spirit working through Jesus. The people who committed the unpardonable sin, they knew who Jesus was, and they had a full knowledge of that it was the Holy Spirit of God who was working in him. Point number one. Point number two, they had a willful rejection of the facts about Christ that his opponents knew to be true. It wasn't like they were on the fence, or I don't know. No, they knew who Jesus was, they knew what he did, and they, in light of who it was, rejected him. And then they did, they stepped it up one more level. You ready for this? They slanderously attributed the work of the Holy Spirit in Christ to the power of Satan. Now, most of you have heard the phrase, a house divided among itself cannot stand. You've heard this? Okay, so that Jesus is talking about that in this text because the religious leaders are so bent on rejecting Jesus. I mean, the evidence that Jesus is who he is is like right there. 
and they are so bent on rejecting him, this is what they do. They say, aha, I know how you cast out demons. And they think, well, you're doing it in the power of God, but we can't say that. So they say, you cast out demons in the power of, what do they say? Satan. And Jesus is like, so Satan's throwing out his own people. Is that, does that make sense? So you mean like Satan's like chucking people out the back door? And what does he say? A house divided among itself cannot stand. He's like, you guys are so far gone. Black is white and white is black. Right is wrong and wrong is right. Now, this is where I think if a person rejects Jesus until their death, they have condemnation. But I think the unpardonable sin, are you ready for this? Can be committed before death. A person who has so hardened their heart to who Jesus is, ready for this? They lose their ability to believe. This is the way it goes in the Old Testament. A man by the name of Pharaoh. Moses showed him who God was. And you know what the book of Exodus says? And Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then later on it says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart again. God says, I'll give you more revelation. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. God says, okay, I'll give you another bit. And it says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then it finally, you know what it says in the text? God hardened his heart. Time's up. So I think the impardonable sin is much more intensive than just rejecting Jesus until your death. Now, here's the application. You say, whoa, Rusty, you put me through a lot today. This is, it's worth listening to all of this to get this bit of application. And here it is. A lot of people think, you know, when I make up my mind good and well, I'll follow the Lord when I want to follow him in the way I want to follow him. I don't think, I know that's not the way it works. The more you hear, listen carefully, and the more you reject, the harder it becomes for you to hear. Like calluses on a hand, the failure to respond to the Spirit of God becomes calluses on the heart. And so I'm going to speak to church folks for a minute. Do you possess, I mean, look how hardened these people have become. Judas sees Jesus and is like, oh yeah, he's no big deal, kill him. The towns where the apostles came, preached the gospel, they're like, yeah, don't need that either. This shows a profound spiritual callousness. And the writer of Hebrews knows that this can happen. And so listen to these words. The writer of Hebrews says, today, if you hear God's voice, his appeal is don't harden your heart. Honestly, I think we all, and look, I live around the Bible. And I am in danger, and you are in danger of just... Is it really that big of a deal anymore, reading the Bible, going to church, singing the songs, praying the prayers? And if we lose our sensitivity, this is not a good thing. And so the truth is, for many reasons, we lose our sensitivity. And and I think the application today is to ask the Lord to really make us sensitive to his word, sensitive to his spirit. This is something we have to fight, to be honest. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Because those who we looked at today heard it and 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 hardened and hardened and hardened and hardened and hardened and hardened and hardened. And Jesus says, that person who's heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it and hardened and hardened and hardened and hardened, 
they're really responsible. And so I just ask you today, are you, are you sensitive to the Spirit of God? Are you, is your heart tender to the things of God, or has something taken that from you? And if it has, and by the way, life does this sometimes. Hurt does this sometimes. Difficulties do, do this sometimes. But we ought to just say, God, plow up my heart and remind me of your grace, remind me of your goodness, remind me of who you are so that I never one day take the revelation of who you are for granted. Today the altar is open and I ask you, if you have hardened your heart to the Lord, why don't you come to an altar? People can come pray with you. And just say, God, soften my heart. Help me have sensitivity of spiritual things like I once did. Help me find my first love that I've lost. And by the way, if you're here and you say, man, I'm a sinner. Well, welcome to the group. But you can come today and receive the salvation found in Jesus. You can come, I'll take a Bible, I'll show you how you can become a Christian. And I can say today, you may be a sinner now, but you can leave forgiven. Come today, receive the gospel. Church, the altar is open. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you, God, that you would just help us realize that God, the ones that you had the sternest words to were the ones who had so much knowledge of who you are and so little response to it. And God, week after week, we sit here, we gather around your word, we have the spirit of God. And I ask that as your spirit moves and communicates to our heart today, if we hear your voice, that we would not harden our hearts. God, we pray that with each day, we would become more sensitive to your revelation, more sensitive to your spirit, more responsive to your leading. And God, as we do that, we experience your life. God, never let it be that with each passing day, we become less responsive to your voice and less responsive to your spirit and less responsive to what you're teaching us. So God, do in us that which only you can do. Help us to appropriately evaluate ourselves in this moment. Help us to see, see ourselves for who we are, the grace we need, and the grace that has been given, the forgiveness that has been given. And God, may we throw ourselves at your mercy and say, God, here I am, a sinner undone, to be redeemed by you. Keep us sensitive to your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together.
you have a wonderful day in the Lord.